Good morning, church family. It's so good to be with you. I am so excited to stand before you, and I never lose the wonder of being able to open up God's word and to just see what God has for us today in this place. I know God has good for us, and I'm just so excited to be a part of that today. Um, The Astros won uh, last night in the 18th inning. Yeah. How far did you think I was going to get into the sermon before mentioning that, right? <laughs> and I may or may not have like two different illustrations that are tied to that today. And so I, in, in Bible college, I tell you, don't use a lot of sports analogies. And I don't. If you're here, I don't use a lot. And I'm, I'm, I'm big into sports. So I do that for you guys because I love you. But like they're in the playoffs and it's the Astros. And so like, you know, you, you got to get on board. Um, you know, it's, it's God's will. So... <laughs> Um, so anyway, um, but it, it was good. 18th inning, that's crazy. A one to nothing game, 18th inning. Um, but anyway, I don't want to go too much into it. I'm going to mention it later on in the sermon, so I don't want to ruin my welcome. But um, we are finishing our anointed mess series today, looking at the life of King David. Have you enjoyed this series? I've enjoyed this series. Um, I got to preach at our Pasadena location um, and our, the message that James preached here. I got to preach the version of that in Pasadena, and we had a great time together. And so we've been studying the life of King David. And the way I say it, say it is like King David, like he only writes hits, you know. Like everything in King David's life is just epic and awesome and applicable. You know, there are some parts of the Bible that... Uh, maybe it, sometimes if we're honest, it can seem a little bit harder to apply to our lives or we have to kind of really kind of go deep to understand it. But there's something about David that's just like universally so relatable to us. Everything in David's life was epic. And as we're going to see today, even his death, even the end of his life on this earth was epic. And David walked deeply with God. David was one of the, if you're new, he's one of the Old Testament kings of Israel, Um, And the kings of Israel were people that were supposed to lead God's people uh, to God and and to worship the Lord. And David was one of those kings, and he left an incredible impact and an incredible legacy that is absolutely undeniable. Uh, King David wrote the famous Psalm 23, which, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, which I always love to tell people um, because this is true. Like that Psalm 23 is considered to be, no matter what you believe, what your faith is, um, considered to be the most well-known piece of literature in the history of humanity across the world. Psalm 23. No piece of literature has been read more or prayed more or observed more than Psalm 23. It's the most well-known chapter in all of the Bible. And King David wrote that out of his own relationship with God. He left a legacy of his heart for God through that psalm. We also looked in this series at uh, the story of David and Goliath, where David defeats Goliath. It's one of the most well-known stories in, in the history of humanity, where David defeats Goliath. And so David left a legacy of faithfulness to God. And today I want to preach a message, if you're writing down the notes and if you want to write down the title. The title today is The Time Dilation of a Legacy. And if you don't know what that means, just stick with me to the end. And I think it's going to make sense whenever we wrap up here today. But here's the reality. Let's get real. We all want our life to count. We all want our life to make a difference for our family and for those around us. We don't want to be forgotten when we die. Some people do. I've heard that's like a thing for some people. They're really into that or whatever. But for most people, right, it's like, man, I want my life to count, to make a difference for generations. I feel like I'm, I was created on purpose and for a purpose, and I, I want my life to really make a difference. We all want to some degree to have a good legacy because of our time here in this world. And I love in C.S. Lewis, uh, his book, Mere Christianity, he makes a a really good case. He was, C.S. Lewis was an atheist um, in the uh, middle of the 20th century who became a a Christian later in his life. He was a brilliant mind and a college professor. And he didn't just become a Christian, but he became uh, really um, someone who made apologetics or arguments for the Christian faith and why it was true. And one of the things he pointed out when it comes to the existence of God is he talked about how Um, In life, our desires reveal what is real. 
And so we have a desire or a longing for water, and so water exists. We have a desire for shelter, and shelter exists. When babies are born, they have a desire to, to suck milk, and, and milk exists. And so, like, when we have desires, they're not random things, that the deepest desires of our heart actually reveal re- reality. And so what he said is, if, if you find in yourself a desire or an emptiness or a hole inside that nothing in this world can satisfy— the most probable or logical explanation is that you were made for something else, for, for a different universe, that there is something beyond what you can maybe physically see with your eyes that you were made for. And he said that was one of the greatest like, proofs of the existence of God. Even the idea that you can think of the concept of God in your mind is a proof for God. You can't, you, you can't think of things that don't exist. You might say, oh, no, no, John, I can't. It's like a, a, a purple elephant with a horn. Well, yeah, but all those things exist. You're just putting them together, right? Like when we think of things, we, we think of things that exist. And so even the idea that we can so clearly think of the concept of God is a great apologetic for God. And I love that concept because I think it also applies to like a legacy. We all want our life to count. We all want our life to make a difference. We all want to to have a legacy, to not be forgotten. And the reason is because we are called to have a legacy. And because you can have a legacy, because you, you can do things in this world. You can live your life in such a way that impacts generation after generation after generation. And that's what God calls us to do. And what I'm going to call us to do today, based upon the Word of God, is to tell us, guys, we got to think bigger in life. We think way too small, and we think way too short term. In the Bible, they're always talking about generations to come, and so we need to, we need to, to live epic lives that are thinking generationally because we are called, you are called, to have a generational impact on this world for the kingdom of God, and do not settle for less. And do not just waste your life. And no matter who you are, what you've done in life, how old you are today, nothing can stop the fact that God wants to do a great work in your life and to leave a legacy through your life. And God is going to show us how to do that so cool, in such a cool way, through the life of King David. So if you have a Bible, turn me to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And I'm not going to judge you if you can't find that because most people can't. Go to the table of contents at the beginning. We don't judge here. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, you've probably never read this before in your life. Maybe you're one of those people that did the Bible in a year, which that, really the Bible in a year is just the Old Testament in a year is basically what it is because the Old Testament is the vast majority of the Bible. Um, and you might have blown through 1 Chronicles chapter 29 if you did one of those reading plans. But other than that, or maybe like a random Bible flip, you know, where God just took you to 1 Chronicles 29. Because I, I believe in Bible flip. Okay, that is divine. I'm, I'm all about that. God guides everything, including like, I don't know what to read today. Flip it open. The problem is you, you normally end up in like Numbers or Leviticus and it's confusing. And so God, one more flip, you know, one more Bible flip, you know. Um, God, you can work through the second one, can't you as well, you know. So... Um, First Chronicles chapter 29, and what we're going to see here is that David's life comes to an end. And when we think about King David and his life and his faithfulness to God, like I said, we often think about Psalm 23. We think about David and Goliath. We think about David being anointed when he was a shepherd boy to become the next king. We think of these like epic stories, and those are all important, but even the way that David's life ends is an incredible model for us. And I don't know if you know this, um, but you're going to die one day. And if you didn't know that, then I'm um, sorry I had to be the one to tell you. Um, you your, your life will come to an end one day, every single person in this room. It blows my mind that for the most part, unless there's some really unique baby over there in the kid's wing, um, in a hundred years, like we will all not be here for the most part. And what's interesting is the world fears death because the world has no answer for death. And yet though there is a natural part of fearing death because it's not God's natural plan, and we're going to talk about that a little bit here today, um, thinking about death is actually a, a really good thing in the life of a Christian because the, the way that you, you finish your life or even just the fact that you know that one day you will finish your life here on this world can really change the way you live today in a really positive way. And what David models here for us today is David models 
an incredible life lived that God wants all of us to do as well. And so we're going to read First uh, Chronicles chapter 29. Um, there, there's a lot in this, so I'm going to kind of abbreviate it. I'm going to start in verse 14, and then I'm just going to read certain parts of this. But it's a beautiful moment towards the end of his life. And one of the things that we love to do is to stand in the honor of reading God's Word. So this time, if you stand with me, and if you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen behind me. First Chronicles 29, starting at verse 14. This is the end of David's life as he is passing the torch to his son Solomon to become the next king. And verse 14 says this, But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, God, and of your own we have given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for you, building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I've seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. And then skip to the middle of verse 22. And they made Solomon the son of David king the second time, and they anointed him as prince for the Lord and Zadok the priest. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king in place of David his father. And he prospered and all Israel obeyed him. All the leaders and the mighty men and also all the sons of King David pledged their allegiance to King Solomon. And the Lord made Solomon very great in the sight of all Israel and bestowed on him such royal majesty as not had been on any king before Israel. Thus David, the son of Jesse, reigned over all Israel. The time that he reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. Then he died at a good age, full of days, riches and honor. And Solomon, his son, reigned in his place. May God bless the reading of his word. You can be seated. Before we dive into this passage today, I want to give you um, a verse that you, you really need to know. And it's a verse that God has used to give me so much wisdom in, in my own life. You've probably heard it before. It's Psalm 90, verse 12. I think it'll be up on the screen here. Psalm 90, verse 12. It says this. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I love that verse for a lot of reasons. And I think what it shows us is that we should live our lives with a reasonable amount of existential intensity. You know, it's kind of a crazy deep phrase, right? We should live our lives with a reasonable or healthy amount of existential intensity. And I think that's what that verse tells us. You see, when we realize that our time is limited, it shouldn't depress us because this is not a depressing verse. The, the, the Bible does not say that teach us to number our days that we could be sad or depressed or worried about it constantly. It's not what it says. It says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So when we number our days or realize that our days in this life are limited, it's actually a positive benefit to our life. When we realize that time is limited, it motivates us to live well and to fulfill our calling until the day that we meet Jesus face to face in heaven with him forever in all perfection. And recently, because of like sports and because I've been watching a lot of that recently, I've been thinking about sports and you know, my kids are starting to get into sports. And what's interesting is, and I've never thought about this until recently, like why sports are what they are. Like what makes a sport a sport? What, what makes something interesting enough to where we want to watch it? What makes it competitive? What makes it fun? And I was thinking it's actually limits and boundaries. 
And so an example would be that a few uh, days ago, uh, the Astros were in game one of the playoffs, and an incredible man named Jordan uh, hit a walk-off home run to win game one. Who saw that? He would walk off home run to win game one. Okay, now that's awesome, okay? I'm all about it, okay? And that, that's amazing, right? But there's two kinds of people in this room, okay? One is that I'm in the first category, that's amazing, okay? That's incredible, okay? Like, I, I'm so happy. Like, this is amazing. Like, I got a little bit too excited about that. But there are some of you in this room, and I, I see you. I want you to know that you're seeing, that you're like, what's the big deal, okay? They're like, I saw it. A guy hit a ball over a fence, Anybody here, you're like, I don't get the big deal with sports or with baseball. My wife and three other people. Okay, about 10 of you guys. Okay, yes, my wife. Uh, like, what's, like, like, you're, like, 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 how did we make this into something? He hit a ball over a fence. Yes. Like, like, what? How did we get to that point? And think about it. It's fascinating. The reason is because somewhere along the way, somebody invented a sport called baseball, or a group of people invented a sport called baseball. And there's a diamond, and there's rules, and this is out, and this is in, and there's a fence, and we decided, or somebody decided, that if you hit the ball over the fence, that's a good thing, and you get runs, and you can maybe win the game. There was a limit, or there was a boundary that was set, and it's meaningful, and so now, because there's this boundary, there's a competition between the pitcher and the hitter. And the pitcher doesn't want the ball to go over the fence. The, the batter does want the ball to go over the fence. And so we watch this intense battle as people compete because of these boundaries that we've set up. If there were no boundaries, if there were no limits, there would be no joy or no excitement in any sport. And that's pretty interesting when you think about it. That it's actually the boundaries, the rules, or the limits that enable us to experience something incredible. And that's what Psalm 90 verse 12 says. So teach us to number our days. Teach us to, to know the limits that we may gain a heart of wisdom. That whenever we realize that our time in this life is limited, we know how to live better live well, and it gives us a healthy amount of existential intensity to make sure that we leave a legacy that matters. That actually, if you didn't number your days and if you didn't know that, you would be tempted to waste your life. But now that you know that, you can use your life for incredible things. And as we look at the life of King David, what we see is at the end of his life, he's still doing what he's been doing for all of his life. And David wasn't perfect, and we saw that last week. David made a huge mistake. David had an affair, got really messy. And that should encourage us that no matter how messy your life gets, God can redeem it. Amen? That's really good news. So, so nobody here is outside of this. Nobody here has messed it up enough or, or lived too long. Like, like nobody here is beyond the grace of God, and nobody here is beyond the reality that God can do something great through your life. But at some point, you do have to wake up, and you do have to get serious because your days in this life, they are limited. And if you realize that, it's not a bad thing as the world says. The Bible says it's a good thing for us. And what we see at the end of David's life is that it's no different than any other part of his life because David had this wisdom and David lived a life that was living for a legacy. You see, you don't leave a legacy if you don't live a legacy. A legacy doesn't just happen by chance, it happens intentionally. And what I want to tell you today in the life of King David and what I want you to see for your life is that, listen, some things in life change. As culture changes, some things change. But what never changes is ultimately what defines a great legacy. And David shows us that here today. Look at our passage in verse 14. I'm going to read verse 14 and then verse 18. And there's so much here. You can go back to even verse 10, verses 10 through 13. There's a beautiful prayer that David's praying. It's such an incredible passage. David knows that he's at the end of his life. He's done a lot of things, and he's passing the baton to his son, King Solomon. But listen to what he's saying. Even at the end of his life, he says, But who am I? Verse 14, And what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly 
For all things come from you, God, and of your own have we given you. So he says, God, even everything I give you comes from you. That's why we give God our time. That's why we tithe. That's why we, you know, love God with our heart and think about him and pray because everything ultimately comes from him anyway. Us giving God back a little bit of what he's given us just says, God, I know where this comes from. And then he goes on in verse 18, and this is so beautiful. He says, O Lord, the God of Abraham. So these are some of his descendants. Of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. And here's the first of two things I want you to see today. The first is this, is that to leave a lasting legacy, we must worship God. To leave a lasting legacy, a good legacy, but also a legacy that lasts, you must worship God. This is not a suggestion, friends. This is not a, hey, you should think about this, or maybe this is kind of how it is. This is what the Bible teaches. To leave a lasting legacy, you must worship God. God. Our legacy is ultimately defined by what we worship. The question is not if you worship. The question is what do you worship? Everybody worships and everybody worships something. And often in our our secular culture, which is basically secular, humanist, we don't want to think about some of these things. And we don't like, well, Christians worship or other religions worship, but I'm not really a worship. I'm not really a religious person. And the reason why people say that is because they do worship, because worship just means to surrender, to bow down. Worship is just whatever is the ultimate thing is to you. But people don't want to say they worship because they have to tell you what they worship, and it would sound really silly what they worship. (coughs) So the common things that people worship today. Health, maybe, right? People worship health. Maybe they worship health from a perspective of being super fit or eating super good or just doing whatever they can to prolong their life, which none of those are bad things. Those are all good things, but they're not supposed to be our ultimate thing. People today worship their career or advancement. They think if I have a good life, then the sum of that is going to be I have a good career that I like or that I did well in or I, I got to some arbitrary goal that I set for myself, and therefore I have a good legacy. For some people, they worship their kids, which kids are a wonderful thing, as we're going to see here a little bit later in this message, but they should not be worshipped. Even as we raise kids, that's only a season of our life. If your whole life is your kids, then, you know, you're going to be very heartbroken at some point. You will live an empty life beyond your kids, Some people worship a relationship. I think this is a common one. Maybe it's a friendship, but usually it's a a romantic relationship. We kind of worship it. We think that my whole life is wrapped up in kind of how this person treats me or responds to me. But the problem with that is that makes you codependent. And this person can never measure up to be God. Marriages get a lot better when you realize your spouse isn't God. And so they're going to make mistakes and you're going to make mistakes and we're going to have to forgive. It's simple, right? But we forget that. Maybe people worship pleasure, just certain feelings or sensations in life that they can achieve. A lot of people today worship politics or the nation that they're a part of. They think if my nation's good, then I'm good. If my nation's falling apart, then I'm stressed. Or some political messiah is going to show up and he's better than the other guy, you know, kind of thing. And we get really into that. Some people worship acceptance, that maybe people accept us. If people are happy with us and like us, then I feel good. And if they're not good with me, that I'm not good. And a lot of people probably worship money or just the accumulation of things. If I have a lot of money, if I'm good financially, then I'm good. I I feel safe if I have money. I feel taken care of if I have money. I feel like my life will be okay if I have money. But the reality is, is we're not called to worship money. And the problem with all of these different kinds of things that we are tempted to worship is they all will fail us eventually and they will all lead us to the wrong place in life if we worship them and will ultimately leave us in a place that we don't want to be and not leaving the legacy that we could have lived. And I think a great example of this, speaking of the uh, Astros, is I saw this really funny picture. Uh, I shared this online earlier um, I'm just going to let that sit there for a second. Um, (laughs) 
if you don't know what this is, allow me to explain. I, I'm very happy to explain what this is. Um, so um, this guy is Jeremy Pena. It's on the Astros. Um, he actually hit the game-winning homer yesterday to seal it. Yeah, we can clap for that. We can clap. We can clap. Clap. Um, but what's funny about this picture is um, this guy used to be this guy. Okay, basically for the Astros. This guy replaced this guy. This guy used to be in the Astros, and he's a good guy. I'm just poking some fun, right? Um, but he was with the Astros, and there's a lot of things that went into why he left the Astros, but the main reason was for more money, right? And what everybody said essentially was, I mean, yeah, yeah, you're going to make more money to this other place that you're going to go, but the Astros is a special team, and we've, we're building a legacy, and you've got like Altuve, and it's like amazing. And so he leaves, and I don't know if they planned this or how this worked out, but literally the guy that left for more money, who, I mean, supposedly his main passion in life is playing baseball, he is now interviewing the guy who's still playing because he's in a much better situation because he hit the game-winning run. And I saw this, and I'm like, this is a great example in life of what happens when you get too into something that should not be worshipped. I think he went to Minnesota, right? Not even like the Yankees or something, the Dodgers, right? Like, like Minnesota, the Twins, you know? Like, I mean, just like, oh, my goodness. You know, he, he had a good season. He did. I'm not, not going to lie, right? But he had any of the playoffs, you know? And like, yeah, money's kind of cool, but like to win another World Series, wh what leaves a legacy in baseball? Like I made money or like I won World Series. And we don't think in life so often, it's like what I'm worshiping, like what, what are the implications of that down the road and what are the implications of that for my legacy? And let me tell you why this is true, that to leave a less legacy at last, you must worship God. Let me tell you why that's true. Because Hebrews 13, 8 says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Isaiah 40, verse 8, one of my favorite verses, it says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. So there are things in life that are a big deal, but they're only temporary. They do not last And I, I never lose the wonder of the fact that today we are, we are studying this this ancient text that is said to be the word of God. And, and one of the things that proves it is that it lasts and it endures. And so I don't know what kind of careers will be around when your grandkids are around or your great grandkids or great, great, great. I don't know what the, the I don't know if America is going to exist because, uh, you know, America is still, I mean, we've been around for like what, like oh, three, 400 years, like, which seems like forever to us, but the span of, span of human history is not really that long. I mean, the Roman Empire fell and it was the big deal in its day. And I don't know what the economy is going to be like, crypto, not crypto. I don't know, right? Like what are the sports? Will baseball be around? I don't know. Will we be living on Mars? I don't know. But the word of God stands forever. And we got to be smart, church. Be smart. You know, one of the things I've noticed in church, like even like when we appoint like deacons in the church, one of the things I love telling them is you are stepping into an historic office that has lasted 2,000 years. Peter, 2,000 years ago, was appointing deacons, was affirming deacons in the church. A guy named Stephen, you see examples of it 2,000 years ago, and we're still doing it today. But what are we investing in that has that kind of guarantee and the beauty of numbering your days or, or, or realizing that we got to really be right about all this stuff is it, it makes us wise so that then we're not foolish. And the things that are most likely to trip us up in life are the things that the world in our moment thinks are a big deal, but really deep down are not. And so we're all tempted to think life is all about money or all about being known or all about our job or how good our kids turn out. Like we're all tempted to those things, but the word of God offers us a foundation that works and we can have a foundation which is worshiping the one true God. And then guess what? We get to build all those other important parts of life that are important in a healthy way and everything is in its right place. 
and then we live a good life in God's grace, and then we leave a legacy for the next generation. See, at the end of your life, people will say this. At the end of your life, people will say this about you. They were really into X. And what is X for you? Everyone's really into something. And when they talk about you, what's that thing? May it be that we worshiped God, that we put God first in everything. And we allowed all of our life to come out of that. You see, the beauty of living for a legacy is it causes you to wake up in life and stop being overly focused on dumb things that don't matter and motivated to truly do something great with your life by worshiping God and leaving a legacy that actually lasts. And so ultimately, our legacy is defined by who we worship. And what we see here with David is that David worships God in the middle of his life and also at the end of his life. David worships God. And in his last days, he is worshiping God and saying, God, everything I did was ultimately for you. And because he worships God, it enables him to now have a lasting legacy that we see continued on. And I want to read just really one verse in this passage. I want to focus in on it's verse 19. So 1 Chronicles 29, verse 19. This is an important verse. There's a lot here. And hear what Solomon says. I mean, David says, as he's passing the baton to Solomon, he says this. So he's praying this to God, but about his son. He says, grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all. So this is almost like a, like a charge or a benediction. He's passing the baton. So life is not just a race you finish. It's a race you finish, but then you pass the baton to the next generation. And not just, I don't mean just your kids. There's, there's kids. If you have kids, that's an important thing. That's anybody that you disciple, anybody that you influence for the kingdom, any, any spiritual legacy that you lead, you pass the baton. And David is doing this here. And what David shows us is that to leave a lasting legacy, we must think generationally. And, and I really want to offer this to you today. I, I really want you to take this because there is so much in this if we will grasp this. Because man, we, we can miss this and, and it, there's just so much here for us if we will get this. I, I bet probably coming to church, you're not shocked to hear that to leave a legacy, you have to worship God. I, I bet when I said that, you were not like, wow, I never heard that before in church, okay? That's important, but you've heard that before. But this is something that's important as well, but, but maybe we don't think about as much or we don't think about as, as deeply enough. And what we see here is that we must think gener generationally. We must think about the people that we are investing in who will carry on the kingdom of God, who will then invest it down to others as well beyond our life, that we are here to set into motion a great, powerful spiritual legacy. And if you didn't come from a family where that was the case or there wasn't really much seriousness when it came to faith or God or living a legacy or changing the world for the kingdom, then you're called to start it. That's what that means. You get to be the first. You get to be the one that, that can change the, the direction of your family lineage. Or you get to change other lives of people that aren't even a part of your family, but that you impact it. I've had people in my life, other pastors, mentors in the faith, various things that literally change the trajectory of my life. And you get to do that too. And I love it because he says, Grant to my son Solomon a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, your stat statutes, performing them all. And what I want to tell you today, which is, which is not a, a common thing people say today, it's not popular, but listen, there is right and there is wrong. There is truth in this life. Do not buy into the stupid notion, I'm just going to let my kids find their path in life. That means you're giving them nothing. That's just a nice way of saying I'm giving nothing. That's the thing. I'm going to let my kids carve their own financial path in life. You know what that means? I'm giving you zero. That's what that means, okay? And today it's like people are so open-minded that their brain falls out, right? Like that, that's what it is. You know, so I'm open-minded. Yeah, it's not a good thing, okay? Like that's dangerous. You're not here to be open-minded. You're here to figure it out. Yeah, you don't know something, so, so pursue the Lord. Pursue truth. 
see what works or, or see what doesn't work. And for those that we invest in or for our kids, we, we need to leave them with moral clarity based on the word of God. That we're not called to let our kids or other people be the experimental rats for the, the new morality of the day. And we'll just see how this goes. Give them clarity. It's a time for conviction. This is not a time for just whatever. It's a good thing to have convictions. It's a good thing to be different. It, it's a good thing to say, no, no, we, we go to church on Sunday. We're going to be there. We're not doing other stuff. It's a good thing for your kids. They don't like it in the moment, but they don't like any good stuff in the moment. And when they get older, they're going to look back on you when they realize how hard life is and when they realize how crazy life is and when they realize how messed up the world is and they're going to look back at you and they're going to know whether or not you could take a stand or not. To leave a lasting legacy, you have to think generationally. You know, one of the things I've noticed recently is my, my daughter got her first report card in first grade. And uh, I think of all my kids, she's the most kind of probably going to be the most diligent one. So she, she's like very focused on getting her stuff done. But what's, what's really interesting is I noticed this. When I got the report card, I, I was truly more concerned about her conduct than her grades. Now, I wanted to pass and get good grades and all that kind of stuff, right? But if I'm honest, like I really, her conduct... Is she obedient to her teachers? Is she kind to other kids? Like, I think in life that will take her farther. I really believe that. And it's, it's my job to invest in my kids and to teach my kids and to, not in a fearful way, protect them from the chaos of the world, but with a vision for the future, with a vision for what her life could be. And so often we've got a vision for, like, like men, you, you got a vision for your job. you got a vision for this. You have a vision for your family. Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you're heading? Moms, do you have a vision for your children? Believer, do you, do you have a vision for the way you want to impact the people around you? That you want to point them in the right direction? And I love this because I love what David says in verse 19. He basically says, he, he basically says, okay, Solomon, listen, like the, here's the commandments, here's the testimonies, here's what works in life and here's what doesn't. And I'm going to be abundantly clear. And one of the things I love that my, one of my mentors tells me is he says, listen, when, when my kids get older or when the people in my church, if they, if, they, if they leave my church or move on one day or they move away, they, they might say that I said too much, but they will not say that I didn't say enough. They're like, my kids are saying, I'm always talking. That's a good thing, you know? And so David is clear with Solomon, but I love it. He's also very practical. He's not just always harping at people. Because look at the other part of verse 19. It says, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. He gets practical. And so David thought for a while that he was going to build a temple to the Lord and the Lord reveals to David that, that you're not going to be the one to build this special temple for Israel. And he realizes, oh, it's actually going to be for the next generation. And so what I want to tell you is a part of what God is doing in your life, and this is not just for people that have kids. This is for everybody that will hear and see this. God is doing something in your life to get ready for something in somebody else's life. And we just don't see that so often. We, we just always think about our life. Listen, you will accomplish things in your life. You are called to. But God is giving you something in your life that is not for you. It is for other people. That God works through his church. He works through his people. And he is working in your life. And for those of you that had kids, some of the things of what you're accumulating right now are for them and for God's calling on their life. And, and David sees this. He goes, he's not, he's not confused. He knows that, that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. So he says, I have made provision. And one of the unique things that makes us humans and not just any other animal is humans think about this. We have the ability to envision the future. I love your dog. We just got our dog Bobo back. You know, he was gone for a while, came back this week. Super awesome. He's older now, but we love him. And he's so cute. And my kids love him. My two-year-old, he thinks he's all tough, but then he's scared of the dog, you know. And uh, he thinks he's a big, tough guy. He's not scared of the dog, you know. I'm making fun of him for it. But um, anyway, um, 
my dog doesn't have a vision for the future. Like, my dog's not thinking about 10 years down the road. Like, you know, animals, they don't do that. As humans, we have this ability to think about what it's going to be like in 50 years. We can think about those things, which means that we have the ability, by God's design of humanity, to think about the future in a unique way, which is a sign that we're supposed to do so. And so David's living his life knowing that Solomon is going to build the temple. And what's cool about it is when David realizes that he will not be the one to build the temple, but Solomon will, he doesn't stop collecting supplies. He keeps doing it. Because he, he knows that he's, he's a part of a story. His whole life is not the essence of the story. It goes beyond him. And so we, we want to, to make sure the people that we are investing our, our lives in, whether we're related to them or not, that, that we are providing for them practically the things that they need. Not that like, I gotta make sure they have a million dollars. I mean, listen, some money's good, but I, I mean just that they're, they are set up in life, that they know what's going on, that they're training them and teaching them because we want them to leave a legacy and we want them to fulfill their calling as well. And one of the things that God spoke to me early on, even just about, about my kids, is that the goal of parenthood is not to help our kids have a good childhood, but to help our kids have a good adulthood. That's the goal of parenting. Childhood's like, what, 10 years? Adulthood's the beginning, majority of life. And especially for a lot of us like millennials, and I'm sure it's true for Gen Z as well, it's like we just can't adult. Like, we just don't have basic life skills so often. And that's hard. It's hard to learn some of those things at 30 or 40 or 50. And so I, I love here how, how David is aware that he was building something even beyond himself. And the way that we ultimately think of this is we have to think generationally. Our life is about the legacy and the impact that we are having even beyond our life. I think an interesting way to think this is, or think of this was there was a, um, there was a lady who called a, a, another church in the city. Uh, a friend of mine is the pastor there, and he was telling me this, like, this like, really, really cool story. He said this lady called. She was in a nursing home. She was, she was at the end of her life, and um, she called this church because this church had had like an impact in, I think, her daughter or a friend of hers' life, and so she wanted to bless the church. It was a really small, kind of struggling church, and so this this lady called the church and, and the pastor, who's a friend of mine, picked up and, and she said, hey, uh, I'm, a, I'm a kind of older lady, but I, I want to make an investment in, in this church. Um, and so I'm thinking of either like 100 or 200. And she was like, can you maybe tell me some projects, or some, some things that I could accomplish like for that money for you guys. And he's thinking like $100 or, or $200. And so he's thinking like, well, maybe you could I'll buy a, artwork or fix up a hole in the wall or whatever the various things that they might need. And he's kind of listing off some things to her within the 100 to 200 range. And she's like, oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't think you're stimmy. I'm th I, I meant 100,000 or 200,000. And he's like, oh, you know, let me, uh, let me rethink the project list a little bit there, you know. And she's like, let's do 200,000. And so he tells her a couple projects that really needed to be done they could never afford to do. And at the end of her life, she gives this money to the church. And one of the things they wanted to do is because she was in a nursing home and they didn't think she was going to live very long was they were trying to finish the project up quickly. So, because they wanted, they had a cool idea of like, we're going to get this project done and then we're going to go and, and pick her up because you know, she can't come on her own. And we, we wanted at least once to kind of see what she did. And he said they finally finished the project and they got it done as quick as they could. And they called up the nursing home and said, hey, we'd like to arrange a time to pick up Miss So-and-so to, to let her come see the, the fruits of, of her investment in the kingdom. And they said, well, we're sorry to tell you this, but um, she, she passed away about a week ago. And what was interesting was when my friend, this pastor guy, when he was telling me this story and he said, you know, she never got to see the investment of what she did. I loved it because he said it in like a hopeful, positive, good way. As in like, we think like, oh, it's so sad that maybe she never got to see this thing that happened. But no, 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 that's a legacy. That's a good thing. How, how blessed is it to not see the fruits of what you did 
for the kingdom of God. That's not sad. That's meaningful. And so I, I want us to, to think about generationally the, the legacy that we are leaving based on the life that we're living. Another example of this is I remember I was close to downtown once and there was a church down there. And it was kind of cool. They were like fixing up this church and it was a really cool looking place. It was kind of close to downtown. And I was like, oh, what's going on, you know? I wonder what church is kind of coming in here. And one day I, I parked and got out of my car. I thought maybe I could see a sign or something, you know, of what church this was. And I parked my car. I got out. I went over to this like really cool looking church that they were fixing up only to find out that it, it wasn't a church. They were actually making it into a dog park. And I'm not against dog parks. I got a dog. I love dogs. I'm all about dogs, okay? I, I, we have a dog park in T.C. Jester. That's amazing. I love it. But I don't want churches to become dog parks. And think about that. Think of all the people, all those years, that tithed and gave to that church, that built it up, that gave of their time and their effort and their energy year after year. They, they volunteered in the nursery even when no kids were coming. They were faithful and they served and they did everything they could after all those years. And if you could have told them, yeah, down the road, this is going to be a dog park, how would that have made them feel? And it reminds me of why we do what we do at New Day of, of replanting and revitalizing churches because there are churches that are literally on the brink of dying in risk of becoming the latest set of storage units in that neighborhood. And churches like ours have the potential to make a difference. I'm not announcing a new campus. Don't worry. That's not what I'm doing right now, okay? There's nothing going on, Right? Something like, oh, we've we been here before, you know. <laughs> I realized that I was like, th th that would have been a great build. That's not what's happening, right? It's what we're currently doing, right? And so, but like, think about it. And we sit in, the, in the, the room with these people talking about this. I don't want it to die. I want it to keep being a church. I don't want it to go. And it's like, sorry, like, you know, can't help, you know, like, it, it's, like, and so what we're doing here, even at New Day, it's not even just what, it's, it's about the legacy of, of what we're doing and the impact that we can have. And I want to leave you with just one more thought because I heard this this week and it was just so, so cool. I was, I was online, I saw this thing. It was an article on this thing called um, Time Dilation. And... It's this kind of mind-blowing thing that like, you know, there's a lot of like physics guys and they talk about stuff and how they understand everything. But this is a unique concept where even guys that do physics, they're like, this blows my mind that this is even true. And this, this theory called time dilation comes out of Einstein's theory of general relativity, which he came out with in 1916. And, you know, I'm going to get some of this wrong. You can look this up for yourself, you know. I'm not a science guy by any means, you know. I'm not a uh, intellect, but... Um, essentially out of the theory of general relativity, they discovered that time is relative, essentially. Time is relative. Based on position, speed, gravitational forces, all that kind of stuff. So we think time just is what it is, but no, time is actually kind of relative, and time can actually be warped. And there's a theory up here, so this is actually an actual theory. I don't know what it means, but I got it online. Um, this is a, an equation called time dilation, and this is going to blow your mind, but let me kind of explain kind of what it, what it means. And I'm just going to read it from here, from the article, so I don't mess it up. And I quote, time dilation refers to the seemingly odd fact that time passes at different rates for different observers, depending on their relative motion or positions in a gravitational field. Basically, time is relative. And here's the example that they give. It's like some interstellar stuff. Have you ever seen that kind of movie? Um, this is what's crazy. Based upon this theory, this is, this is true. Imagine a spaceship traveling at 95% of speed of light to a planet 9.5 light years away. Based upon the time dilation theory, which has been proven, a stationary observer on Earth would measure the journey of time as di of distance divided by speed or 9.5 divided by 0.95 equal 10 years. Basically, the spaceship crew members, on the other hand, experience time dilation and thus perceive the trip as only taking 
3.12 years. In other words, between leaving earth and reaching their destination, the crew members age a little over three years while the people back on earth have aged 10 years. So you, you can travel at such a speed that you actually age slower. Now, the, the granted, light speed, it's very hard to go light speed, right? And I'm not sure if we'll ever be able to do that, right? But if you could, because time is, is relative, you would literally age slower. And what's interesting is when you think about your life, you know, we normally think about the years of our life. How many years will I live? What will the duration of my life be? But what the Bible teaches us is actually your impact is relative. We say, well, am I going to live 60 years or 90 years or am I going to live 20 years? Am I going to live a few more years? Am I going to live a lot more years? But the length of your life is not what God is focused on. God knows the number of years that he has for you. And the reason why that's not the main focus is because that is irrelevant to the impact that your life actually has. That the same way that an incredible amount of speed can warp time, what I want to tell you today is that an incredible life of faithfulness to God, focus on the right things, can, can warp the impact that your life has in creating a lasting legacy that our focus should not be on the 60 or the 90 or the 20 or the five years that we get, but on living a life that is leaving a legacy for the kingdom today. And so as we draw to a close, I want to bring us back to that verse that we started with, Psalm 90, verse 12. When it says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You see, the world approaches the end of our life with two things, fear and avoidance. And you know that's true. I tell the world, like, when it comes to death or how long I'm going to live, we're either afraid of it or we avoid it. And the reason why most of us, maybe even Christians, why the idea of, of death doesn't seem endearing to us but fearful and why it doesn't seem like a, a, a profitable thing but a negative thing is because we've just never been discipled or trained on this topic. The Bible has much hope for your life, no matter how long it goes. The Bible has so many good things that can come from your life, but we have to know what the Word says. And what the Word says is that whenever we number our days, we gain a heart of, of wisdom. And so when we think about our life and we're thinking genera generation of what we need to realize is that, listen, there is a natural level of maybe fear or uncertainty that we will always have about death because the Bible says that we have the Spirit of God now because we follow Jesus, but we still struggle with the flesh. And we won't be perfected until heaven in the end. So there's always going to be a part of us in our flesh that is, that is a little bit broken, that is always tempted to have a little bit of fear. That is always going to be there. But for the Christian, what is increasing is the Spirit of God in us. And so as we grow and develop and get closer to Jesus, yeah, there's always that little bit of sting that we might feel. But hope and joy and endearment is growing as we realize that we can live a legacy. And when we think about death, two incredible realities emerge for the Christian. The first is this, hope. When the Christian thinks about hope, when, when the world thinks about hope, it's just fear and avoidance. I don't know what, what to do with that. But for the Christian, when we think about death, it reminds us of the great hope that we have. It reminds us of the hope and the fact that Jesus died and rose again to conquer sin and death. And I think God could have saved the world in any way that he would have wanted to. And I think the reason why God came into the world, we called him Jesus, and the reason why he did it through death and resurrection is because he knew that we would be tempted to fear the end of our days. And so Jesus comes and Jesus dies and he rises again and the church springs to life and we to this day carry the message and the hope of the gospel 
And when we think of death, we remember the death of Jesus and his resurrection, which he says, I have prepared for you too. He says, John 14, do not be afraid. I go to prepare a place for you. He knows you're gonna be afraid, but, but don't do that. So the first thing, when we think of the end of our days, we think of hope. David died with hope. And the second thing we get is wisdom. That because our days are limited, it creates so much wonderful, joyful intensity on the present to live the way that we're called to live and to think about the impact that we can have beyond our life. Because we can't, it's not just that we can do that, but we're called to do that. And we do that through worshiping God and ultimately through investing in the generations beyond us. How cool that we're talking about this right now when we're actually fixing up our kids' building for the future. That we came together and, and we, we raised money as a church. We invested. We made provision like David did for his son, for Solomon. We made provision for this, this new thing that would be built. Because we are not the end goal. We, we are simply carrying the baton for a season that we will pass. And so as we finish today, I want to leave you with one phrase. One phrase that I, I think if you can hold on to this, it will give you that wisdom that you need. And it's that what matters in the end is what should matter today. What matters in the end is what should matter today. You see, the end isn't scary if we leave a legacy for the kingdom. And as a pastor, I can tell you, I've, I've seen so much life. I, I've been there when babies are born. I've been there when people pass away. I've been there when confessions are made. I've been there when lives are falling apart. I've been there when jobs and careers are, are transitioning or somebody got fired. I, I have seen so many things in life and, and, and it's true what the studies say. They say that at the end of life, all the people care about are God and people. That's all they care about. Which is interesting because Jesus said the sum of the law is to love God and love people. It's the greatest commandment. And that as we live that way today, we can be assured that we will accomplish great things, not just in our life, but through our life for all the years to come. Church, let's be like David. Let's carry on that, that faithfulness and that legacy by caring about today what matters ultimately in the end.